Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We have our very first presentation with Talisker Resources. Uh, so really looking forward to hearing the story. There will be an overview of the company as well as they will dig into the recent drill results from this morning from Braylorn, as well as the discovery they had last week. As always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can find them on the company's disclosures on their website. And there will be a Q&A section at the end, so feel free to input your questions, the Q&A box at the bottom, or you can email them to me at debra.adcap.ca. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Terry Harbour, CEO, and Matt Philgate, VP Corp Dev of Talisker Resources, which trades under the ticker TSK on the full board TSX. Hi, gentlemen. How are you? Uh, very well. Uh, thanks very much, Deb. And uh, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, coming along today. I'll run through a bit of a recap on the company of any new uh, interested parties that might be on that, that may not know Talisker Resources well. Uh, so a little bit of a recap on the company, what our assets are and where we're operating. And then we'll have a look at our new discovery at Golden Hornet. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, our first four drill holes that we've just received last week. Uh, and we're expecting the other 10 holes uh, to come in relatively uh, in, in short order. Also, some updates on our resource at Braylon. Uh, we've just restarted drilling there with six rigs, soon to go to seven rigs. We've got a large volume of assay results that will be coming out uh, over the next few weeks. One of those came out today, a pretty good intercept. Uh, happy to answer any questions about that. It's really showing some of the good grades and thicknesses that we uh, can expect at Braylon. And this picture here on the front for any newcomers is what we're drilling at Braylon. Uh, these lovely mesothermal veins, the whites all quartz there, quartz and carbonate, and the dark is very fine sulfide where the grade goes very high where, where gold gets dropped out. So a few key points about Talisker for anyone who hasn't had much experience with it. We've got two fully permitted resource stage assets, Braylon and Ladna. So the key words in that are the, are the words fully permitted. So these are projects that could go into production relatively rapidly. And we understand what the value of that is. We've seen a great deal of merger and acquisition activity from the mega mergers of last year and the year before up to a lot of project scale acquisition as uh, intermediate and large scale major producers start to look for assets that are either in production or near to production. So a big benefit we have is there's no five year permitting timeline to get these projects into production. They're fully permitted now with major mines permits, existing tailings dams, connections to a, a grid power electricity, and um, Braylon uh, actually has a, uh, a water treatment facility and full uh, water discharge permit. So a lot of value there in the time value of having permits. Both of these resource stage projects, both Braylon and Ladner, are encompassed by 100% owned district scale brownfields land packages. So both of these packages are around 14,000 hectares so it's not just a project, it's a large land package that's around it that provides a lot of upside and exploration in a brownfield sense. Below our two resource stage projects, we have one of the largest greenfields land packages in British Columbia held by a junior company, about 250,000 hectares. And within that, we control 85% of the Spencer's Bridge Gold Belt which is a low sulfidation epithermal emerging gold belt. Many of you may know of or be shareholders in uh, West Haven Gold who recently put out their maiden resource of around about a million ounces at their shovel nose project. We're happy to say that at the end of last year, we completed all of our greenfields work on this 250,000 hectares. So it's early stage work, stream sediment and soil sampling. We've been doing that for the last three field seasons since we founded the company in 2019. So far, we've developed a pipeline of 15 greenfields drill projects, the first of which, Golden Hornet, uh, we completed drilling last year and have just made the discovery release 
last week. We've also got the Dora project, which is currently permitted for drilling and drill ready, and the Nova project, which is a brand new discovery from our Greenfields program. So it was follow up from stream sediments. It started out as two separate projects, Nova and Cyclone. Last year, we were able to do a mapping program between these projects and join them up. So now we've got a five kilometer vein field. So we're very excited about this to be able to define a brand new, newly discovered vein field in British Columbia in the Spencer's Bridge Gold Belt. So we've uh, completed all of our second phase work that prepares it for drilling. Uh, we've done our engagement and we've submitted the drill permit just in December this year, and we hope to drill that project coming summer this year. So really what we're building here in Talisco is a robust project pipeline with projects at different stages. Braylon's at resource drill out, and we'll touch on what we're drilling out at resource. Ladner underneath that already has a resource of 700,000 ounces. That's the next in the pipeline. The next stage down at discovery phase is Golden Hornet. And then below there, we have various projects at permit stage, pre-permit stage or drill ready stage. So we've built a whole pipeline and what we want to build is a mine factory. We want to build a whole series of projects that we can develop into resource stage. A recap on Braylon for any newcomers. Again, fully permitted. It was a historic producer. A total of 4.2 million ounces was produced at Braylon over 40 years at an average recovered grade of 17.7 grams. Braylon was the highest grade, longest producing gold mine in British Columbia and a top tier percentile production uh, around the world. There was a, uh, on average, a per metre gold production of 4,300 ounces per vertical metre, so a very rich gold mine. We're currently conducting a 100,000 metre drill program at Braylon. We're nearing completion. We completed nearly 90,000 metres of that last year and we're in the final phases of completing that this year to be on track for our first resource statement, which we expect to get back somewhere in Q2 this year. So very close to coming into that first resource for Braylon, and we expect to get a major re-rate as a company with that resource. So far we've identified 61 veins. 14 of them will form the base of this first resource. So there's a lot of upside, a lot of other veins that we still need to model and build into our next resource. We're estimating a resource in the range of one and a half to two million ounces at eight to nine grams per tonne. So a very strong resource. All of this that we're defining is from surface to 700 meters. We see a lot of upside below this. There's confirmed veins down to two kilometers depth. So a lot of upside sitting underneath our initial resource and we see clear potential to be able to target 5 million ounces plus at Braylon. Outside of Braylon, we also own a 33 kilometre mineralised trend within this large land package. There's about 47 historic mines and veins that are spread throughout this area. A lot of them need new work and drill activity. A recap on Braylon, a recent acquisition for Talisker just finalised in September, October last year. 14,000 hectares that cover 100% of the Hosamine gold belt. Ladner currently has around about a 700,000 ounce resource base. We're going back to basics and doing a 10,000 sample soil program this year, and we want to target a million ounces indicated and then work towards two to three million ounces of inferred resource in the next 18 months. Golden Hornet, we'll go into a bit more detail, but it's at discovery phase. Just under 5,000 metres of drilling completed last year. Very happy that we were able to intersect semi-massive sulphide and silica 
sulfide breaches in all 14 holes. So a, a very good discovery kicking off. The first results, the headline that we were able to get from our first four holes was 8.8 grams per tonne gold, 0.42% copper, just under 15 grams per tonne silver, over 5.1 metres. So a very good intercept for our first series of drilling. The Nova project, just to recap again, newly discovered five kilometre epithermal vein field. We see significant sample results there. We want to drill that to discover the Bonanza zone down at depth. And we're in progress in the permitting phase and we expect to get a permit issued early in the summer this year. Major catalysts, major milestones that we see coming. The first one that we're in now is the Golden Hornet discovery. We've got several more press releases as these assays were come in. And visually, some of you may have seen the press release that we put out when we started drilling some very good looking rocks, very sexy looking rocks with lots of sulfide and uh, material that we think will carry gray. Throughout Q1, we'll be receiving about 40,000 meters of assay results. We've currently just got about 10,000 samples that have come in in the last week and we're running quality control. And Matt, our VP of Corp Dev is preparing the cross sections to release those to market. So we think there's some very good results coming there out of Braylawn. So everyone, please keep your eyes out for some very good results similar to what came out this morning. In Q2, we expect to have our maiden resource. We see this as a major catalyst and a major re-rate just around the corner for our Braylawn project. We want to continue on from there and start to expand our Braylawn project, start to head towards 3 million ounces um, as we finish the year, just continue drilling with the team and the resource and drill programs that we have. We'd like to drill our first drill program at Nova. We're very excited about that large vein field and we want to see how well the Bonanza's developed at depth. And then finally, towards the end of the year and then coming into 2023, we want to start targeting and then move to drilling that million ounce indicated resource at Ladna. So a lot of very strong, very powerful catalysts coming in throughout this year. An update for everybody on where all our projects are located. South Central British Columbia, highway access to all of our projects from Vancouver. Highway access to the New Afton mine are owned by New Gold. Straight highway access. One of the reasons why New Gold has become our significant strategic partner. Investing last year to take a 14.9% shareholding in Talisker. Very clear why New Gold would want to do that. Golden Hornet sits over here to the east, over near Rock Creek. We'll have a look at Golden Hornet. Sits outside of Spencer's Bridge and sits away from Braylawn and Ladner. Uh, we'll have a look at what the rest of the results for Golden Hornet were. So it's high grade, fault controlled quartz sulfide breaches in veins. It's what's called an intrusion related system. It sits on the contact of an intrusion and it's host rock. The headline hole, the hole headline intercept, nearly nine grams, 8.88 grams per ton uh, gold. A good values of copper, 0.42% copper and nearly 15 grams silver over five metres. Sitting within a broader zone, a broader fracture halo of uh, 2.59 grams per tonne of gold over 21 metres. We also got a good intercept in hole three, 11.58 grams per tonne of gold, 0.37% copper and 11.1 grams per tonne silver over just over a metre. Some other broad intercepts centred on just under 10 grams over half a metre, sitting within 0.82 grams over 10.3 metres and 0.96, just under a gram, over 6.7 metres. So very early days with these first four holes. 
but we're very happy that we've got good high grade and broad payload mineralization in every one of those four holes. We drilled 10 holes at the central Golden Hornet zone, um, just about three and a half thousand meters. This is the central Hornet zone here. These first four holes here are what have been projected onto this section. We were targeting this nearly three kilometer gold in soil anomaly. So uh, we still got some more results to come back from here and at the iron sky zone that sits up to the northwest, that's about a kilometer away from Golden Hornet. And this is what we're looking at. Nice silica sulfide breaches. Nice broad zones of mineralization. What we see here in the top photo is that nearly nine gram per tonne bulked out across five meters, a 22.7 uh, gram per tonne gold, a 5.54, a 12.8, a 2.06 and a 1.12. So a lot of good intercepts that made up that composite. Uh, we see here some very pretty looking rocks, a lot of sulphide, uh, a lot of silica in these breaches, well-developed sulphide veining with both pyrite, pyrotite and chalcopyrite, uh, chalcopyrite bringing in those, those copper values. So uh, a very good basis, and we're expecting to get our next results out to market probably early next week for Golden Hornet. So a lot of good news coming both from Golden Hornet and out of Braylawn over the next uh, month or two. So I'll quickly jump a reminder of everybody on our uh, shareholder base and share structure. Talisker has got a very strong institutional shareholder base. We're a majority held by institutions and strategics. Some big names in there with Franklin Templeton, RBC, Sprott Group, Gold 2000 out of Switzerland, Equinox out of New York, uh, Merck, Donald Smith & Co, and a whole series of other uh, very strong shareholders there. We've currently got about $13 million in treasury, um, so well-funded to make it to our, our resource base. Very quick recap on our management team for any newcomers. Uh, our management team been together for a long time, about 20 years together. We're all big company trained out of BHP, Anglo-American, anglo Gold Ashanti. We're all PhD and master's level. We're all very fortunate to have a master discovery record uh, just over 55 million ounces now since forming our careers. So we've got a, a lot of experience in developing new areas, executing programs and building and mentoring teams that can take projects right to fruition at resource stage. Very quickly to touch on Braylon again. Braylon's a very famous deposit. It's Canada's only world-class deposit of this type, a phenerozoic orogenic gold deposit or mesothermal gold deposit. It's only beaten in all of the Americas by the supergiant Grass Valley and Motherlode. And we're here exploring at Braylawn because we think we can move it into that giant level. It's made, located on a major terrain suture. So it's got large scale plumbing from very deep within the earth that's been brought to surface. And it's a very long, extensive fault system, nearly 33 kilometres long. Braylawn's very well known for the continuity of the veins. And here we're looking at a long section view of Braylawn. The veins are in white, the name veins, and the veins can be up to a kilometre and a half of continuous strike length. One of the reasons that Braylawn's such an excellent deposit that was mined for such a long length of time. Our main exploration focus has been on areas of Braylawn that are a long strike or down dip from where they historically mined. What we're looking at here is a long section through the three historic mines. Each of the dots that you can see is a three foot wide drift assay. Um, each of these drift assays has been assayed. The purple ones that we can see is greater than 15 grams per tonne. So the second thing that Braylon's very famous for is grade continuity. And we can see here that there's a kilometre, in this case, 
nearly 1,300 metres of high-grade continuity. All of these areas here where there's no grey, the grey are mined out areas or mined out stopes. And we see large areas along strike and in historic ownership gaps between the historic mines. And this has been the focus of our drill planning and our drill execution. We've taken these historic drift assays and we've built vein uh, planes or vein chutes using the historic drift assays. So our resource drilling is very low risk because we know exactly where the veins are and we know exactly what grade we can expect from those veins. So that's why our intercept rate or our success rate in drilling is almost 100% because we're not drilling to find veins or discover them. We know exactly where we are and that's how we can hit multiple veins going forward. Final slide here before we jump into uh, any questions. This is some of the progress of our veins. So we're well advanced in this pathway to developing our first resource. The blue areas that you can see of these long sections, so these are if we've cut a vein directly along the vein itself. The blue areas that we can see are areas that are resource potential. So they're our target models that we drill. The black dots are where we've drilled and got results. The uh, yellow or gold areas are areas that we see our potential resource being. So these are where we've applied a plus three gram per tonne uh, economic cutoff. The actual cutoff may be different to that, but we're working at a relatively industry standard rate of, of three grams. And we're building everything within that that would be potentially mineable. So you see, we've still got some dots that we're conducting, which are planned drill holes or um, holes that have been completed that we're waiting for assays for. So we're well advanced here. You see some of these veins, 500 metres by 400 metres panel of all material that we're starting to develop. The 55, we've probably got the most in. The King vein at King, that's uh, well developed as well. Um, a good plunge depth. We've still got a lot of work to do to continue this strike to get these results back. And that'll all be happening over the next couple of months. The main vein down at uh, Pioneer, early drilling on this. It's uh, the focus of some of the more bulk tonnage mineralization that we've been looking at, uh, shaping up very well as a good resource base. So these are just a selection of four of our veins that we're working on. We've got about 14 that we're developing into our first resource base. Um, and once we've got a whole series of results back, I'll present another webinar that gives a full resource update as to where we're at. Just wanted to make it clear that we're well on track to meet our target. Um, the timing of that target will depend on uh, the laboratory's ability to, to bring our assays back on time. Uh, we've seen some delays last year industry-wide. Uh, we're hopeful this year we won't see delays like we did last year. And then our team just needs to model these veins as volumes and then we calculate our final resource and release it out to market. That's about the recap on Braylon and also where we are at Golden Hornet. Some very exciting intercepts coming at Golden Hornet. Hopefully very soon we'll be getting the next series of sections out there at Golden Hornet to see if we can extend that into a significant footprint. It's certainly looking uh, pretty good at this stage. Matt, I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to uh, d discuss before we throw things open to any questions. No, nope, nothing on my end. Um, I just want to thank Deb for hosting today. And moving forward, we'll be using Adelaide Capital for these. So appreciate it, Deb. Yeah, no, it's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Usually I like to kick off with my own questions, but one of my former colleagues and friends asked a question. So he's always such a gentleman. So Eric, you get the first question. Um, what are the royalty encumbrances? And I guess the second part of that is maybe you can walk us a little bit uh, through how Osisco and New Gold came to be shareholders. Sure, absolutely. At, at Braylon, 
there's a 1.8% NSR and at Ladner there's a 1.5% NSR. So uh, generally my objectives in negotiating royalty sales and a royalty sales is a good method to avoid uh, equity dilution when we can. Generally, I try and keep royalty bases below 2%. Most high-grade deposits can obviously work with a much higher royalty burden, um, but certainly for optics' sake, I like to keep those royalties below that 2% level. Um, it just makes it a lot easier to transact. And also, if some parts of the deposit are lower grade, it, it, it doesn't have any impact on the economics. Uh, so that's that's basically what sits on the project, uh, 1.8 at Braylon and 1.5 at Ladner. How is the Cisco involvement? Uh, uh, Cisco are a, a significant strategic shareholder. I think they've got about 5.5%. Uh, Cisco entered as a shareholder and a royalty owner um, when we transacted the acquisition of Braylon from Avino Silver and Gold Mines. They, they took an equity placement. Uh, and we also negotiated to sell them a uh, uh, 1.2% royalty, sorry, uh, for 6.2 million when we did the transaction. Uh, so that's how they became involved. The Talisker Group's got a long standing relationship with the Cisco, I've been associated with them for uh, around about 10 years. Myself, I worked as uh, chief geologist at the uh, Caribou. Uh, deposit when it was owned by by Barkerville, who Cisco was a major shareholder, is that now is the Cisco Development Corporation. Uh, and many of our geologists uh, I met there at Barkerville, including Matt, who's our VP of Corporate Development. Um, so we have a long-term relationship and they often work with us to assist us in funding and with non-dilutional royalty sales as well. So we keep that keep that down. Maybe I missed it. Did you cover New Gold? Oh, uh, New Gold, yes. So um, <laughs> New Gold currently have 14.9% ownership in Talisker. They became uh, Cornerstone shareholders in Talisker in April last year. Uh, as, as part of, of their shareholder agreement, they have first right of refusal financing rights and top-up rights to maintain uh, 14 Point nine, uh, they have been active in executing those top up rights, so they keep maintaining that without out diluting out. It, it's a clear strategic play for New Gold. Um, all of our projects are, are, are truckable on major roads to New Afton. It'd be an interesting area consolidation for New Gold if if they were to acquire Talisker or Talisker's projects. So far, they've been a very good partner to have, um, and we, we, we're doing some interesting all characterization uh, and talking to them about possibilities of trucking ore to the New Afton toll mill. So I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities there relative both to Braylon, but also to Ladner and to our bigger asset base in general. Okay, since we're on the subject of other issuers, we have an audience question. Uh, can you go over the investment in TDG Gold? Absolutely. So we divested our, our Tudagon assets uh, to, to TDG um, in an all-share deal that had a market value of around about $5 million. This deal was, was closed prior to uh, listing. We've, we have an uh, escrow legend warrant. Uh, that basically brings out 15% of those shares uh, every six months. So initially we had about uh, 33% ownership in TDG um, with some capital raises and some sales of shares. We've diluted back to about uh, 18%. And so we've sold about 4.7 million uh, of those shares and we currently have about 2.5 million out of escrow. Uh, and we'll have about another two and a half that'll come out in June, another two and a half that'll come out in December. And then uh, in 2023, that same pattern, 2.7 in, in June and another 2.7 in, in December. As part of our shareholder agreement, we have first right of refusal to participate in financings if we so desire um, and top up rights and also rights to uh, maintain two, two board seats which we currently have. And do you have investments or interest in any other companies that are meaningful? No, 
No, only in uh, only in TDG. Um, our strategy as a company is 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 not to speculate on the junior market. Um, really, we re have received and will receive shareholdings in other companies through uh, our <laughs> divestment strategy. Um, but really, it's a way for us to raise raise capital and a way for incoming acquirers not not to have to uh, dish out cash for requirements. Somebody may have the question as to why we divested the Tutagong assets. Uh, there was a number of reasons for that. Um, the, the first is related to our focus uh, solidly in South Central British Columbia. Uh, the Tutagon assets were uh, a bit of a distraction for us, a long way away, a very short field season and a high running cost for us uh, when we had a major focus in South Central British Columbia. We did really like the assets, but we didn't have the team or the focus to be able to take them forward. So we decided that uh, it would be better to find a well-financed team who could um, execute that program in a shorter time frame than we'd be able to. Uh, so that's why we partnered with TDG and, and divested those assets. And uh, TDG has certainly done that. Uh, they've invested a considerable sum of money into drilling, uh, into capturing that database, and they expect to be moving towards a, uh, a resource there um, within this year. Okay. Well, since we're on the subject of M&A, you answered one of the questions I had about uh, geographic focus. The other question, I guess, is you've acquired both Brownstone and or Brownfield and Greenfield assets. Uh, do you have a preference? Uh, what's your view on, on the types of things that you may look for in the future? In general, we aren't restricted by project stage. We're more focused on project opportunity. Uh, and in general, if, if there's limited availability of more advanced projects, then greenfields and grassroots exploration is the only option. Um, luckily, we have a lot of experience and a, a good uh, generative team that we can generate new areas and then take them through the stages of exploration. When we first formed Talisker Resources, um, everything we had was early stage, everything was greenfields. Um, so we immediately looked for advanced projects that we could get some drill results out to market and get some excitement in the company because many investors don't have the patience to work through a multi-year greenfields exploration program. Uh, we saw a lot of opportunity in Braylawn and we also saw a lot of opportunity in Ladna. Um, so opportunities where we can acquire an asset relatively uh, cheaply and uh, bring back multiples in those assets. And Braylawn we acquired for around about $10 million value and we recently acquired Ladner for about $5 million value. Um, so we think they have a lot of upside um, and we're happy to uh, crack the code on those projects that may have been around for a long time um, and that's really what we're seeing here with both Braylawn and Ladner. I had one more question about sort of your overarching strategy, and then we can get into the recent results and the assets because I have some questions there. But I guess the question was the focus on South Central BC is part of that accessibility uh, existing infrastructure as well as the extended drill season? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a lot... Um, it's a lot cheaper for us to operate in South Central British Columbia. There's a number of reasons for that. One is simply access. Um, we've got roads to everywhere. Nowhere in our Greenfields program was more than 40 minutes drive from a, a population centre. So we don't need to, to build any access. We don't need to use helicopters. We don't need to transport things with helicopters from Southern BC. Um, we've got an extended field season. So we, we don't really have a uh, a three or four month uh, window to get our work done. We can get our work done uh, over 10 or 11 months. Um, we've also got um, a fairly arid environment down where we are. Unfortunately, this year that, that reflected in very hot temperatures and, and, and some wildfires. But in general, what it translates to is limited snowfall. So we can work for a lot longer and it's a lot cheaper to work. So. When we when we compared to uh, companies that work in northern areas, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we divested the Tudagong assets, 
was that what you can achieve in eight or nine years up north, we can do in two or three years at a, at a greatly reduced cost. And we really see that differential in our all-in drill costs. Our all-in drill cost is in the high 280s to $300 a metre, whereas up north it's five to $600 a metre. So that brings a lot of benefits to us. We can do things a lot faster and a lot cheaper and achieve our aims. And with the sizable drill program that you had planned last year and for the upcoming year, I'm assuming that rig availability is not as big an issue for Talisker? It, it is a challenge, uh, a challenge for everyone across the industry. We've got some very good drill partners and, and although we had planned at the beginning of the year to go directly to eight rigs, uh, it took some time to access those rigs. And uh, by November, we were able to get our seventh rig on and now we, we constantly have seven rigs uh, drilling at site. Um, so more of the challenges that we face industry-wide are not just rigs, they're also drillers and drillers off siders who are, who are trained and knowledgeable to, to operate those rigs. Um, so that, that is a challenge as we go forward, but we've got a very good relationship and we can um, keep those rigs locked in so we can achieve our, our drill meter targets. Okay, great. I'm not going to bore you, me or the audience with talk of lab um, holdups. So let's talk about the the two assets that you had exploration results on um, recently. You get to pick. Do you want to go Braylorn or do you want to go Golden Hornet? Oh, I'm we'll happy to both. talk about them both. How, how about we <laughs> how, how about we start with um, with with Braylorn? Sure. Um, I had a couple questions about that. Maybe you can walk us through your timelines to uh, you're, you're coming out with a maiden resource this year, then hopefully an updated resource. I guess, can you talk about a general timeline to sort of a construction decision and production? Sure. Um, at, at this stage, our, our, our strategy is to not take uh, either of these assets into production. Our, our forte and where we really bring our value is, is related to um, up to uh, PA or re resource development stage. I know we all say that as explorers and uh, many of us end up having to put things in, into production. Um, so if, if we have to do that, then that's something we'll have to do, but certainly it's not, not our focus and, and not our objective in this stage. To be fairly clear, it would be quite simple to put either of these projects into production. Braylon's fully permitted right now with both major mines permit and water discharge permits. Uh, it's got a state-of-the-art water treatment facility, fully functioning and maintained tailings dam, a good strong uh, camp there for 130 people, great communications infrastructure connected to grid power. Um, so it's, it's fairly turnkey. Uh, all that it's missing is a significant enough resource to warrant that, and that's what our focus has been. We certainly may look at some bulk bulk testing, but at the moment we, we aren't planning on a, on a full-scale production scenario. Okay, and can you talk a little bit more about the East Braylon results and where the hits were relative to past uh, or historical production? I'm not sure I saw a, a map on that. Oh, and Matt, Matt, perhaps you can uh, load up LeapFrog and we can have a, have a look exactly where that is. Yeah, sure, no problem. Sorry, I hate to do that to you, Matt. Great. Okay. Just to orient everyone quickly, this is the town of Braylorn here. And this is our mine offices down here. Um, we got the King Mine, which is up here, the main Braylorn mine, the main historic Braylorn mine, and then Pioneer Mine down in the south. So just to break that up into context, when we talk about Braylorn West, we're talking about this area over here, which sits just northwest of the main Braylorn mine. And when we talk about Braylorn East, we're, we're talking about this area down here, um, which is just outside the Pioneer Zone. So if I if I go underground here and, and give you guys kind of a, a cross-sectional view of, of the deposits, and I'll just turn off these planes for a second. Majority of our drilling so far, the results we put out, have been focused over in the Braylorn West area. And I think you've probably seen that in, in past press releases. A lot of those results were focused around that 55 vein, 55 hanging wall vein. The results that we just put out are over here in Braylorn East. So probably about three to four kilometers away from a majority of the results that we put out. 
Because if we look at it on a project scale, these three mines, it's about five, five and a half kilometers. So fairly robust, large area that we're exploring. Braylorn East sits over here. And a majority of our drilling has been in Braylorn West. So a lot of this stuff is pretty new to us. Um, when we talk about the 52 vein, um, we have about 13 drill results from the 52 vein um, compared to compared to 40, 50 over in, in Braylorn West. So our modeling team is currently working on bringing the 52 vein up to the level that we're seeing at the 55. So our general understanding of it. Um, so it's currently being remodeled. And, um, and we should have that done probably in the next couple of weeks. But we're, we're seeing very consistent high grade results on this 52 vein. So it's really exciting. Um, and then as far as continuity goes, these results that you guys are seeing in today's press release are over about a 660 meter strike length. Okay. I actually had a question on vein uh, 55, if you want to leave your screen up, Matt. Sure. Hi, Terry. It looks like continuity is shaping up nicely as assays trickle in. And based on those long sections you showed, it looks like the 55 vein and hanging wall and now 52 vein today could be big contributors to the maiden uh, MRE. Is that a fair observation? Any other veins yeah. you'd highlight? Yeah, absolutely. We on, on the 52, there, there is there, there's a big patch of infill in between those holes, but uh, a lot of that infill is is based on uh, targets from the historic drift assays. So it's pretty low risk to drill that out. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd I'd agree with with that assessment for sure. I think they'll uh, well the the 55 absolutely. You know, it, it seems to be a fairly strong. A strong vein, um, you know, we we rarely have uh, lower than cutoff intercepts with it, uh, but we, we're certainly pretty excited with how the 52 is turning up now, and uh, pretty you know pretty excited to get those those additional holes drilled and the assays back. Yeah, so I just turned on the the current vein model, the vein mesh that we have for 52, and and it's pretty preliminary. Just as results come in, it's being updated constantly, um, but you can kind of get an idea just from the, the sense of scale here. We're, we're talking about kilometer plus strike length um, based on some of the historic drift results that we're seeing um, down at the bottom here. And so everything's filtered about five gram there. So these drift samples, which are three foot drift samples um, are all about five gram. And, and we're, see, we're seeing that strike continuity along this or 52 structure as, as it comes together. And then they had a follow-up question. Was any guidance on when we could see Pioneer resource contribution? So um, it, it'll all be in this initial resource. Um, most of the, well, the, the whole focus for this resource is to, is to hit that high-grade target um, range. So um, I, I suspect that that question was regarding the, the bulk tonnage at, um, at Pioneer. Um, so just to keep ourselves focused, we want to get this high grade resource out and then we're going to come back and look at that more bulk tonnage material, particularly which seems to be focused around the main vein and, and the J vein. Um, anyone who, who goes through all our, our assay results probably, probably see that there's quite broad halos with, with high mineralisation, you know, up to 10 to 20 metres around those. Um, so what we want to do is model all these veins, the narrow veins in the resource first, and then we're going to come back and have a look at that more bulk, bulk tonnage scenario. But um, certainly in the high-grade resource that will be coming out in Q2, uh, we'll have, have uh, two or three of the pioneer veins in that resource, the high-grade ones, the main and the, and the J. And that's, that's what I'm showing right now on the screen. This is the, the main vein. Okay, I don't see any others that would involve that, but actually I have a question as I'm fairly new to the story. I know you've been drilling Braylorn with the intent of putting out a maiden resource. Have you guided to the market how much is uh, indicated versus inferred or um, maybe you can give me a little bit around your intentions on the on the MRE? All that we're targeting, uh, targeting now will be inferred. Uh, th th there's a small component, um, I think it's about 120,000 ounces that's, that's in M&I category now. 
um, that that sits in the in the gap between uh, or near King in the gap the BK zone. Um, so there might be some uh, slight increase in that uh, in in the indicator, but m most of the focus we've got is simply to define that larger inferred footprint. Yeah, that's it there. And will that be the same intention with expanding the resource uh, later this year with drilling? Yes, basically um, what we really want to do is hit the target resource and get this first resource out so we can build that baseline valuation for the company. Uh, and then it's, it's basically, it's pretty straightforward. We just look at it drilling a long strike from these veins and then starting to work under, underneath these veins. So um, really it's, it's the long strike or close to surface from zero to 700 metres that, that we're um, designing the drill plan for now. Um, and then from then we, we look to go deeper for that bigger scale potential underneath. <clears throat> go big, right? Go big or go home, um, that's what they say. Exactly. And then you may have covered it a little bit, um, but I was curious about uh, your bulk tonnage exploration or what you're, you're doing with the bulk tonnage program on Brain Lorm. We'd um, <laughs> put a significant amount of holes in there. Uh, I forget how many we've got. Uh, we, we, we first started right down in the southeastern end, uh, and that's where those discovery hits were, where they, those 100 gram metre plus intercepts. Um, we wanted to maintain focus on this first resource, so we've um, continued drilling where we could intercept high-grade veins as well. Um, so sort of killing two birds with, with, with one stone. Coming into this resource, we won't have the time to model all that bulk tonnage to get it ready for the resource. Um, so we still need to do some more work in understanding what that bulk tonnage looks, looks like and what the mineability would be both uh, in an open pit scenario and in an underground bulk tonnage scenario. Um, so we're in, in the process of that, but we just don't want to lose focus on getting that, that first high-grade resource out and then we can come back and have a really good look at that bulk punish potential, which really seems like it's considerable. And a pretty good example of that, I'll, I'll, I'll get Matt just to show all of the intercepts that are above uh, 0.3 of a gram, just to show what this lower grade bulk tonnage distribution actually looks like across the whole belt. Yeah, so I have that set already. <laughs> so. The, right now we're looking at the pioneer zone. So hole 48 was the, the hole that we put out that was uh, 400 meters at about 0.5. Um, and then as we go away, I mean, you can see it's pretty clear that there's, there's gold everywhere. Matt, can you just turn off those stopes so we can see yeah. what's behind the stopes or make them a bit transparent? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think what everyone can pretty clearly see is that across four and a half kilometres, there's basically gold everywhere. So what our challenge is, is we need to put economic wrappers around this. So we need to wireframe this and build out where across this entire smattering of gold everywhere is the best place to actually mine it. So we can see that there's, there's every hole has intercepts that are bulk tonnage ore grades. And we see in the key areas that there's just intercept after intercept. So there's a lot of work to do to be able to build these economic wrappers around it. And that'll be our focus in the second half of the year is, well, how much of this gold that's everywhere? Because, you know, gold, gold occurs as little, little nuggety blebs and it, it has to be distributed or diluted within a mineable unit. So... What our focus will be is, is, is to look at that economics. How can we apply that economics and build which areas can be economic open pitable, which can be economic as narrow veins, which can be economic as bulk tonnage underground, and potentially which areas could, could be amenable to a large scale bulk tonnage such as a block cave. So there's a lot of work to do, but... Just looking at the gold distribution here, you, you can you, you can see why we're excited about it because th there is just gold everywhere. I think that's all the questions I have on Braylorn. 
Um, so moving over to Golden Hornet, can you talk about the depth of the highlight hits at Golden Hornet and whether open pit is possible with the topography there? Uh, sure. In in the first three holes, uh, I think certainly within a uh, would fit within a pit shell. Um, the fourth hole was uh, well, it wasn't exactly a hail mary, but it was an unplanned step out uh, because of the mineralisation that we saw in hole three. Um, so we, we we stepped out considerably and we we drilled underneath to undercut to see what the continuity was was like at depth. Um, so I, I guess a component of what we hit in hole four uh, would trend up into that. Um, all the other holes that we drilled are sort of less than 200 metres uh, vertical from surface. Um, so all the, all the rest of the holes coming out. Hole, hole four was a bit of an anomaly because we saw such sexy looking stuff in hole three that we decided to do that unplanned, un unplanned step out. I guess time will tell what the what the assays look like. The, the real thing that we need to look at there is for, for bulk tonnage or, or open pit, what the distribution of the grade actually looks like. So we probably don't have enough holes in it yet to make any sort of inference on that at this stage. Just got to have a look and see how, how it goes. So in answer to the question there, um, uh, hole four, maybe not, might be too deep, but all the rest of the holes here certainly within that open pitable realm. And how close to civilization is Golden Hornet? Is it close to any towns? <clears throat> oh, Matt, how, how far away is Rock Creek, would you say? Yeah, it's it's about a 25-minute drive from Rock Creek, so about 35 kilometres. And that's south of Kelowna. I'm just wondering whether there's going to be issues with development or anything like that. Are they pro-mining in that region? Uh, it, it's a it's a resource-based area. The uh, the whole of Golden Hornet's been fairly significantly um, uh, uh, forested, um, and there's some <laughs> there's some grazing grazing lease rights up there. But really, around itself, there's hardly any population at all. Okay, and then some general questions. Um, so, any strategies to mitigate forest fire season and increase the odds of drilling Dora and Nova in the SBGB, I don't know that acronym. Uh, Spencer's Bridge, uh, Spencer's Bridge Gold Belt. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, strategies. Well, um, they're pretty unpredictable at this stage. What we try and do is uh, areas that are known to, to have um, high risk areas, we try and get that work done early in the field season and <laughs> Try and avoid the, the the really late late August super hot realm. Um, unfortunately, this year that that caught us out because a, a lot of the fires came very early in the season. We saw those um, record hot temperatures in uh, particularly around the Linton area, uh, around the Spencer's Bridge Township. Uh, that unfortunately um, just destroyed the uh, township of Linton, burned it to the ground. So I, I, I wish I had a good answer for that. I, I wish I could say, yes, we have a, a coherent strategy to be able to avoid the fires. Um, but really it's it's more management and monitoring. Um, uh, one of our project geos has got very good connection with the aerial uh, uh, firefighting teams um, we're, we're constantly on the on the government websites tracking where the fires are. Uh, we have a well developed um, <laughs> mitigation and um, uh, execution plan if we need to evacuate. Um, and we also work work a lot with the local communities to really understand what the risk is um, and be be engaged with those communities. Um, but being able to control the fires, really, it's out of our out of our realm. Um, we, our, because of the risk involved, we, we'd just rather evacuate and and leave. Um, it was tragic last season. It, it was it was a terrible season uh, for the community in general, but particularly for our First Nation communities who who had the impact of of the residential schools and and uh, the discovery there in Kamloops within the COVID pandemic, 
followed by major wildfires that, that destroyed a lot of people's lonely, uh, livelihoods, the towns, Lytton Band office lost its band, uh, Lytton Band lost its band office, several of the chiefs lost their houses. And then at the end of the year, we, we got floods that washed the highway away. Um, so it's really been an unprecedented year and really impactful. And in a way, I'm, 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 I'm quite pleased that we're able to achieve what we did under the circumstances. Having a, a global pandemic, I think, was difficult enough to manage, testing people and having quarantine and then having all of these natural disasters, a, a 500-year flood event at the end of the year. Um, so it's really been a challenging year and I hope this year is a bit less challenging, uh, particularly on the, on the environmental front. Um, we've already seen road closures from unseasonal um, snowfall. Highway 99 was closed, Highway 40 was closed early in the season. Um, so I just hope it's, I hope it's a better year and I hope we can mitigate the fires the best way by simply not having them. Mm -hmm. I hope you're right. So just a few other questions to wrap things up. So biggest risks and concerns in 2022? Uh, potential biggest upsize surprises, and maybe you can list some of your catalysts. Just round out that question a bit. Sure. Uh, I guess always the biggest concern for us is um, access to capital. Last year was an interesting year. On average, junior companies were down 30%. Um, we were able to maintain our position last year. Um, there was not a lot of inflows into in institutions particularly towards the end of last year. That seems to have changed a bit this year. So really access to capital is, is I think, always one of the major challenges in a, in a challenging year. Strangely enough, we have a, a strong uh, start to the, uh, the gold market this year. Um, unfortunately, that's usually reflective of international unrest. Uh, and, and, and we see that certainly in uh, Eastern Europe um, and also on the economic front. So the, the biggest challenge, I think, is access to capital and reflection in the market uh, relative to what the uh, Federal Reserve decides or doesn't decide to do in the United States. So there seems to be knee-jerk reactivity to the gold price uh, and then flow through into our share prices uh, <laughs> because of that. So I, I guess they're the challenges I see coming forward. Um, our projects, I think, are quite de risk, particularly Braylon. Um, so I don't see any geological risk there. It's, it's more a case of executing the program and we're going to hit our, our resource targets. Uh, potentially, there's a bit more technical or geological risk at Ladner simply because uh, we don't have the geological information. Uh, to get that first million ounces and beyond there, I think, is, is relatively straightforward. Um, but outside that, it'll come from our geological team's ability to, to execute their uh, data gathering and interpretation. The biggest upside that we see, well, I, I've, I, I hate, hate to make the impression that I might have a pet project, but I, I really like the Nova project. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very exciting, a brand new discovery there. It seems to have a very big footprint, just looks spectacular in outcrop. Um, uh, despite the fact that we're above the Bonanza level um, uh, and we're going to drill down to Bonanza, we're seeing a lot of grade at surface in the wall rock, which is very unusual for, for these style of deposits. Um, so I think it, it's, it's, it's part of the most thing I'm, I'm excited about. Um, you know, we're, we're very happy with Golden Hornet. Um, we've got a lot more work to do there. It certainly had a very good start at this stage. Um, so I think moving towards a, a bigger drill program there and a footprint program could, could perhaps bring us into our third resource uh, for the company. So I think that's pretty exciting and, and provide a lot of upside. Um, I, I guess the biggest um, unknown upside might be if somebody comes over the top to, to buy us or some of our assets. So I guess that, that might be uh, something that we, we're not particularly planning for, but there seems to be a lot of interest and a lot of M&A activity. So I think that's something that we, we, we certainly need to keep our eyes open for 
um, intermediate and major companies are certainly on the hunt to backfill the asset, the, the ounces that they're producing. And we've got great permitted assets that we're building resource on in a tier one jurisdiction, very close to infrastructure. I think that's a great summary. I do have a couple more questions if you've got a little bit more time, Terry. So um, you mentioned your cash position, which I believe you said was 13 million. Does that include the recent 7.5 million from Cisco's uh, strategy for additional funding, the NSRs? Um, So uh, (laughs) a lot of the, or or a component of the 7.5 went to paying off some uh, of the debt that we uh, acquired through the New Car and Gold Corp um, uh, acquisition. Um, some of that went to the, uh, the bonding for New Car and Gold Corp. Um, and another component of that uh, went, uh, went into our camp redevelopment at Braylor. So we updated our camp, uh, now 130 man capacity that we have there. Um, so some of those funds were already earmarked for that, some of those hard dollars. The rest of those hard dollars will stay um, for our GNA costs and the management of the operational component of Braylawn, uh, which is the management of the water treatment plant, um, monitoring of the tailings dam and all of those things that sort of sit outside of the uh, expiration. <laughs> what are our, our strategies for um, continuous funding? Although we, we still do have some scope for additional royalty sales, um, you know, I've always said that I'd like to keep our royalties capped at 2%. Uh, I'd like to build a bit more value both at our resource projects so, so uh, we can re- receive a better premium for those. With uh, uh, the, the Ladner buyback and sale, uh, that strategy worked pretty well. We were able to to make about three times of our uh, of our our cost. So that worked well. Um, with um, the the Braylon sale uh, of the additional royalty, there it was about a a forty percent premium on the original transaction, uh, which was also at a premium. So I think they were they were quite good mechanisms to raise raise cash. Um, so we do have some scope there, I think, um, coming, coming around the resource. Um, our other strategies is, is to work with all of our shareholders here by helping us by buying more shares to, to move that share price upwards. So any um, additional capital raises that we do are at a, at a, at a less, less dilutive sense. Makes sense. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I did have a question of um, EV per ounce, where you're trading at and where your peer group averages. Do you happen to know that offhand? Uh, <laughs> more or less. Um, so we're, um, I think we're trading at about a, uh, a $40 um, <laughs> per ounce valuation. Um uh, assuming that the uh, analysts who have coverage are correct, and we have a uh, based on a 1.5 million, uh, 1.5 million ounce deposit, I would expect the industry average for a defined resource at the moment is around 70 in, in in the low 70 dollars an ounce. Um, so I expect that's where 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 we'll head to. Uh, hopefully, we can get a increased resource. Uh, might be some premium for the fact that we're permitted, that we're in a, in a tier one jurisdiction um, and that we're high grade, uh, might, might bring some premiums to that. Um, th- th- you know, there's, there's quite a significant range in EV per ounce valuations, um, depending on the company. You know, we generally look at the Canadian-based companies um, that really, really sort of sit around that 70 to 75 uh, an ounce. Okay. Couple other random questions. So, holding costs of Spence's Bridge Land Holdings, and still, uh, do you plan to divest the projects? So, our, our, our holding cost is coming up to crunch time at the end of this year. Um, it, it still is in our divestment uh, strategy there um, to 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 move those move the projects that we consider non core um, out to other groups who can continue to take them forward. 
Uh, we initiated a divestment strategy last year, but the market just wasn't in the position to deal with it. We had a lot of interest, um, but unfortunately, not many companies were in any position to raise the capital required to take the projects forward and to, to do us a deal that we were willing to accept. Um, so in answer to the question, it really depends on market conditions for this year. You know, I'm hopeful that there's a lot more inflows into the market um, that we have. You know, I think almost everybody's undervalued at the moment, and I think most of our shareholders are probably feeling that heat because a lot of us are uh, predominantly invested in, in, in the junior mining space. Um, so I'm hoping that corrects and we, uh, we get back to, to normalised valuations and there's more inflows. Um, and if, if that's the case, then we'll, we'll certainly look at partnering with, with groups that we like, who've got good teams and good access to capital, to take those projects that we see as non-core coming forward. Uh, because really, we you know we have our hands fairly full with a with a pretty large portfolio of drill projects, um, and with the increase in the assessment costs, uh, with long term holding, it just doesn't make sense for us to to hold on that ground forever. Um, there is some possibilities that we can um, distribute uh, drill costs across the entire belt prior to splitting it up. Um, so there is potential to potentially continue on for another year or two. But really my view is that if we've done the work and we've evaluated the projects, then if we don't think it's good enough, let's give somebody else the chance. Okay. One last question for you, Terry. What's your favourite scotch? <laughs> um my, 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 my favourite scotch is actually Lefroy, um, but I didn't want to call a company after Lefroy because nobody would be able to pronounce it or spell it. So that's how we ended up with Talisca. All right. Well, I think I, I told you it would be 45 minutes and I've kept you for an hour and 15. So I think we can wrap it up here. Is there anything that we didn't cover today that you wanted to? Uh, no, I think I'll just uh, <laughs> reinforce what the catalysts are and the milestones that are coming <laughs> very soon, that we've, we've got a, a large volume of press releases coming out on a weekly or bi-weekly basis over the next couple of months as we finish this program, leading into that maiden resource that we see there solidly in Q2. Uh, everyone's seeing what the long sections are looking like. It's developing very well. Um, we, we're fairly confident that we're going to hit those targets, both resource and grade range, um, more results coming out for Golden Hornet as they come in. Uh, the first four holes look like a good discovery, but it takes more than one section to get a discovery. So we'll be seeing what these step out holes look like, um, both close to Golden Hornet and further out. Um, and a lot of uh, interesting upside at Ladna as we kick off the, the um, summer field season there and start to uh, build our targets to build that out to another multi-million ounce deposit. Okay. Well, I think that's a really good summary. I had my own summary too, if you want to hear it, see if I learned anything, Terry. Sure. So right. what I've written down is <laughs> um, high-grade vein continuity, full, fully permitted with bulk tonnage near surface potential and massive exploration potential that you get for free. Uh, lots of news flow on multiple projects. What do you think? Sounds pretty good. You were paying attention. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. As always, if anyone has any questions that weren't answered or any that you think of, feel free to reach out and I'll get those <coughs> answered for you. And yeah, looking forward to working together. Right, and sure. if anyone doesn't follow Talisker on social media, they definitely should. Thanks, Thank everyone, you, for your time. Right, Thanks, Dave. Terry Thanks and much. Matt. Thanks, Thank everyone, you. for joining today. Appreciate it.